I'm David Hutchins with VOA's Middle East Monitor. Coming up, Syria's Assad threatens to execute anyone caught distributing arms to terrorists. Turkey and France spar over a law that allows acknowledgement of historical genocide against Armenians. And one of the oldest instruments in the Middle East, the oud, is dissected by our musicologist. It's all ahead on Voice of America. Syria's state-run news agency says President Bashar al-Assad has issued a new law allowing for a death sentence for anyone found to be distributing arms to terrorists. Tuesday's announcement comes a day after Syria agreed to allow observers to monitor whether the government is following a peace plan designed to stop a crackdown on anti-government protesters. Assad's government has blamed the months of unrest on, quote, armed terrorist groups. Rights activists say deadly violence continued across Syria on Monday despite the signing of the Arab League plan. The activists said government security forces gunned down as many as 70 army deserters on Monday as they fled their posts along the Turkish border, while another 30 people were killed in other parts of Syria. The U.N. General Assembly overwhelmingly approved a resolution on Monday condemning this violence. The U.N. says at least 5,000 people have been killed during the nine-month uprising. Now, the Turkish-Syrian border has become a key conduit for the Syrian opposition, including defectors in the Free Syria Army, who have set up an underground network of bases. Henry Ridgewell reports from VOA from that area on opposition activities from the Turkish side of the border. A couple of kilometers over the border, a cell phone video captures Syrian soldiers firing on people trying to flee across to Turkey. Locals say the Syrian army has now deployed snipers and units all along the frontier. Dozens of people have been killed in the last month. They include Dr. Ibrahim Otman, one of the leading figures in the organization Damascus Doctors, which ran an underground network of clinics to treat wounded protesters. Fellow activists say he was shot dead while crossing the border. The Syria-Turkey frontier has become a key conduit for the opposition. At a refugee camp in the village of Yaladag, one former soldier described how he defected and fled to Turkey. <laughs> I was faced with two choices, he says, either to shoot the demonstrators or to be shot myself. So I defected and fled from the army. After I did that, I got the news that my father had been shot and killed. I didn't know what to do, he says. They also took my cousin. He is six years old, the soldier adds. I was not the only one who defected from the army. Another ten soldiers fled with me and came here. All my family are at home, so I can't reveal my identity. Army defectors have formed the Free Syria Army to take on Assad's forces. Turkey has said that international forces could create a buffer zone at the border if the situation worsens. The Free Syria Army says that would give it a launch pad to topple the Assad government. But for now, the defectors are heavily outnumbered and outgunned. One activist took VOA to see a basement safe house in the Turkish city of Antakya. The Free Syria Army is run through a network of bases like this. <laughs> After dark, the activists gather in the basement, greeting each other warmly. One of them, Wael Khadi, says his brother is a captain in the Free Syria Army. He says they need international help. There is no outside help for the Free Army, and they do not have the capability to overthrow Assad, he says. If they get that support, I think we will achieve the freedom of Syria. But with the current situation on the ground, it is impossible. So far, international powers have indicated they have no plans to intervene militarily in Syria for fear of the consequences across the Middle East. So the activists along the Turkish border and the protesters inside Syria will continue to fight alone. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, Antakya, Turkey. And on our website, MiddleEastVoices.com, we're launching a unique social journalism initiative called Syria Witness. In the course of covering Syria, it's been difficult for us and other journalists to get firsthand information. Foreign journalists are severely restricted from operating from inside the country, and many popular Internet websites that are used for communication are blocked, which forces activists and citizens to use proxy servers or other methods to keep in touch with colleagues and loved ones or journalists. 
We have been very interested in seeing what it's like living day to day inside Syria for the thousands of those enduring this growing conflict. So we conceived this idea called Syria Witness, and editing and reporting this project is our senior reporter, David Arnold, who joins me now. Hi, David. Hi, Hutch. All right. What is Syria Witness? Uh, This project was an effort to get people to tell their personal stories about living in one of the most chaotic countries that that we can identify. And what we're most interested in is getting these people to talk about what they fear, what they think, what makes them angry, and what makes them happy about anything that goes on in their daily lives. These are people who are isolated from the rest of the world. Uh, They have street demonstrations. There is street violence. Uh, There are probably divisions within families over politics, and we're trying to tell this story with a a reach throughout the country. What we want to do also is make sure that these people are able to tell their personal stories without fear and without fear of the filters of politics and traditional journalism. So the idea is sort of like a written documentary. We're following the same characters over and over week after week. Um, how many people have we gotten signed up so far? And obviously we can expand this, but we have a certain number now. Uh, how many and how hard was it to find them and get them to agree? We have three right now, and it's it wasn't hard to get these initial three, but it's hard to go beyond that. Uh, we're looking for more witnesses, and uh, we've tried to get a diversity of voices in the project. The problem right now is that we have people telling essentially one side of the story. So what we want to do is find other people who are willing to engage with us in this project, people who support the government, people who are against the government, people who are indifferent to the government and just want to live in a peace and quiet. Now, your first installment was an individual that we're calling Sammy to protect his uh, security. Tell me about Sammy. Sammy's 24 years old. He lives in Holmes. Uh, He is a university student, and he has a part-time job in town. He is also a demonstrator. Uh, He's a very interesting young man. who is. He takes photographs. He puts them on, on his Facebook. He's a very active participant in what he sees as the liberation of his country. Uh, we wanted to be sure that he wrote freely and accurately about what he experiences. So we really can't tell you anything else about who he is, and we're very careful in each of the reports that he is not personally identifiable. And uh, there's one more question before I let you go. Uh, where do we hope? Where do you hope? I have my own ideas, but where do you hope to take this series? Well. It's it's sort of like with Sammy. He's talking today about the Free Syrian Army and their role in the demonstrations in homes. We just don't know day-to-day, week-to-week, how this story is going to evolve. It's a story that's being told by Syrian people, and they will be telling the story of Syria. And week-to-week, month-to-month, we'll just have to see how this evolves. And if you guys are looking at it now, we just posted it on Facebook. That's Middle East Voices at Facebook. Uh, and you can also check out MiddleEastVoices.com. Senior reporter David Arnold, thank you very much. Thank you. Turkey is continuing to ratchet up tensions with France over a proposed French law to criminalize the denial of claims that Turkey committed genocide against its Armenian minority during World War I. Dorian Jones reports from Istanbul. The Turkish government has dispatched a high-level delegation of parliamentarians to France in a last-minute bid to lobby against proposed legislation that will criminalize the denial of mass killings of Armenians before and during World War I as genocide. Ankara rejects the charge of genocide, saying that deaths occurred during civil strife, in which many Turks died as well. Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan launched a stinging attack Saturday against the proposed legislation. Mr Erdogan says no historian, no politician can see genocide in our history. He says that those who want to see genocide should turn around and look at their own dirty and bloody history. Historians say up to one and a half million Armenians were killed during the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in World War I. Several countries recognize the killings as genocide. Under the proposed French legislation, denying the genocide will be punishable by up to one year in prison, along with a $58,000 fine. Relations between Turkey and France are already tense in connection with French President Nicolas Sarkozy's strong opposition to Ankara's bid to join the European Union. 
Mr Ertwan last week reportedly sent a letter to Mr Sarkozy warning of dire consequences if the legislation is passed. Diplomatic correspondent Semi Ediz of the Turkish newspaper Milliet warned such threats should be taken seriously. I think it's serious. I think that the government will make a big issue out of this. This is not one that they can uh, afford to let go by. In terms of public opinion, I mean, this is this is one of the most touchy uh, of issues for Turks, and you can't just take it lightly. Opposition to the genocide claim is one of the few issues that unites Turkey's normally polarized main political parties. The main opposition, People's Republican Party, is due to send its own deputies to Paris to lobby against the controversial legislation. And the leader of the National Action Party, Devlet Bacheli, strongly backs Mr Erdogan's stance against Paris. With such cross-party support, the potential repercussions to French-Turkish relations are expected to be severe. The Turkish ambassador to France has said he expects to be recalled if the French parliament passes the legislation later this week. International relations expert Soli Ozel of Cardiff Haas University warns that will be just the beginning. Ban the French from all uh, economic bidding. For the future, they're not going to give the French companies the, the light of day. It may not be impossible that they will try to reduce uh, diplomatic relations. And wherever Turkey can block France, uh, it will then try to do so. Last week, Turkish Foreign Minister Ahmed Davutoglu summoned representatives of leading French companies to explain what is at stake for them. With trade with Turkey accounting for 2.5% of France's annual international trade, observers say such threats will have limited effect. But the repercussions of a deepening dispute threaten to extend beyond France to the whole European Union. Diplomatic correspondent, it is. Yes, I think there is this negative potential. Based on good information that uh, the foreign minister met uh, EU ambassadors and lashed out at them, you know, over this issue. Foreign Minister Davutoglu has warned the European Union has a responsibility to protect freedom of speech. The ongoing crisis in Syria may also be affected. Despite strained relations, Paris and Ankara have found common ground in their opposition to Damascus' ongoing crackdown on dissent. But the head of the Turkish Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee, Volkan Buzkur, warned in Paris bilateral cooperation in the region would be significantly harmed if the legislation was passed. Dorian Jones for VOA News, Istanbul, Turkey. Egyptian security forces have clashed with protesters in Cairo's Tahrir Square in a continued effort to disperse those calling for the ruling military council to step down. Police and soldiers raided the square early on Tuesday, trying to clear the area in the center of the capital that served as the hub of protest against former leader Hosni Mubarak. Protesters and security forces hurled stones at one another, and police fired shots to try to disperse the demonstrators as the clash has stretched into a fifth day. At least 12 people have been killed and more than 500 wounded since Friday. Sunni Muslim Vice President Tariq al-Hashemi has denied charges that he was behind a plot to kill government officials. He says charges brought against him by Iraq Shiite-led government are politically motivated. Hashemi said he's ready to face trial, but only if the case is transferred to Iraq's northern Kurdistan region. He spoke with reporters in Kurdistan today, a day after the central government issued a warrant for his arrest on accusations of terrorism. The Obama administration expressed concern over these developments. A White House spokesman said the United States urges all sides to work to resolve differences peacefully through dialogue in a manner consistent with the rule of law. Now, the last convoy of U.S. soldiers left Iraq for neighboring Kuwait on Sunday, ending an almost nine-year U.S.-led war that ousted Saddam Hussein and left a fragile democracy. The withdrawal ended a war that cost about 4,500 U.S. troops, tens of thousands of Iraqis, and hundreds of billions of dollars. Stephen Zunes, the Middle East editor for Foreign Policy Focus, sees little that is positive, at least in the short run, about Iraq's future following the U.S.-led invasion in 2003. 
we've gone from a situation where there was a terribly oppressive but largely defanged dictator to a country that is still on the verge of civil war between Arabs and Kurds, between Sunnis and Shias, a country that is a real hallmark of instability for the region rather than a model for democracy. We see a, a government that has little credibility among large segments of the population, which is ranked as one of the most corrupt regimes in the world, according to Transparency International, where many basic government functions are not taking place, even providing uh, basic electricity. We see a situation where there are thousands of political prisoners, torture is endemic, extrajudicial killings are widespread, hardly the model for, for democracy. And we see uh, the biggest threat to Western interest in the region, Iran, now having an ally, whereas they once had a very strong adversary in Saddam. What do you see for the future of Iraq? A continued instability. I see a continued factionalization. I am not very optimistic for the short to medium term. However, I do believe that over time, we will see a reemergence of civil society, uh, which, of course, was, was badly damaged through a uh, decades of Saddam's totalitarian rule and then the occupation and war and sectarianism that followed. But Iraq does have a fairly well-educated population. They have a population that is sick and tired of violence and oppression. And I do believe that eventually, as in elsewhere in the region, we will see the emergence of democratic civil society movements that will ultimately transfer the country uh, to a more uh, stable democratic rule. And that was Stephen Zunes, Middle East Editor for Foreign Policy and Focus. Ben McQueen, an Iraq analyst at Australia's Monash University, says violence in the country is also a big problem. There were 200 civilian casualties there last month. I mean, these are still significant numbers, and there's still major issues that haven't been worked out in terms of the, you know, the political structure of the economy, the power-sharing system. Is a post-U.S. Iraq going to ally itself more closely with Iran, and does that have far-reaching consequences? Yes. Any Iraqi government, at least under the current system or any modified system, will either have a significant Shia presence or a Shia majority, the bulk of which will be groups that have not so much, you know, they're not, it's not fraternal ties with Iran, it's not looking at deep cooperation, but there are certainly links there and there are certainly shared interests there and shared antagonisms. And that's just something we're going to have to learn to live with. The flip side of that being coalition of Kurdish and Sunni Arab parties, which A, is just not feasible in terms of their structure, and B, would lead Iraq to maybe not so be so close to Iran, but have some other unintended consequences, which mightn't be good for us in the long run anyway. What is the biggest hope that you see for Iraq in the future, and what is its biggest challenge? The biggest hope is the Iraqi people. There is a genuine enthusiasm for measure of political freedom, participation in the region in particular. Um, Iraq's always considered itself, and rightly so, as one of the key Arab states, and it wants to get itself to a point where it can participate regionally as a capable, reasonably vibrant economically and politically country. It can be proud of, of its new system. That sort of sentiment is one thing that definitely holds the Iraqi people together. The biggest worry is the fragility of the institutions that might curb elite self-interest, so the leaders of sectarian communities who might see greater profit or benefit for themselves in continued division and conflict as opposed to moving toward a greater deal of unity and cooperation. And it's very easy with weak institutions for those groups to exploit divisions and continue that instability. That was Ben McQueen, an Iraq analyst at Australia's Monash University. One of the most soulful stringed musical instruments in the Arab world is the oud. It's also one of the oldest, an instrument that has been historically referenced as an oud or a lute in Mesopotamia, the Old Testament, the Ottoman Empire, and also featured in modern Arabic classical music. VOA's Paul Westfeeling found out more about this instrument, courtesy of VOA ethnomusicologist Brian Q. Silver. <laughs>
Brian, this music sounds very familiar, yet it's very exotic. Uh, what's the instrument we're listening to? It's called the Ode, the string instrument most prevalent throughout the entire Near and Middle East, from North Africa up to Turkey, and all the way to Iraq and even Iran. But i got a question for you. Why do I feel like I've heard it somewhere before? Well, historically, it's the ancestor of the medieval lute. Al-Oud, the Arabic term for the lute, became lute. It entered the European world through Spain, through the wonderful kingdom of Al-Andalus, where there was a marvelously rich golden age of cultural interaction among the peoples of the region. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As a result of the musical exchanges that took place, the oud found its way into the other European areas. Here is the more familiar lute, played by the great Julian Bream in a performance of Vivaldi's Lute Concerto in D in a purely Western idiom. What are the differences between the oud and the lute? The sound is certainly very similar, though... The style of play is quite a bit different. Well, both instruments are very similar in form, with a pear-shaped wooden body fashioned elegantly of many strips of wood glued together, a flat soundboard, and a neck that leads to a sharply backward-angled tuning section. When we looked at a picture of it, I described it as a gourd, a big, fat gourd. Would that be accurate? Well, not really, because a gourd is usually circular, okay. and this is definitely pear-shaped. The number of strings vary, up to 24 in the Baroque lute, and usually all but the bottom string tuned in pairs on both the oud and the lute. Seems to me that uh, playing the lute is more precise, and on the oud, well, that seems to be a little more fluid. Well, this is because the lute has frets to facilitate it being played in the precise Western scales with minimal ornamentation, whereas the oud has no frets to allow for playing the scales of Middle Eastern music, which have many more microtonal intervals, intervals that sound out of tune to us, than the scales of Western music, and many fluid ornaments. Got a question for you, since I know very little about the oud. Do you play it with your fingers, or how do you play it? Well, now, generally it's played with a feather quill in the olden times, or now with a plastic plectrum that gives a distinctive slapping sound. In an emergency, you can even use a collar stay. Let's hear some more of the ode uh, so our listeners can hear the differences you've outlined. And by the way, who's the artist we're listening to? He's a young Turkish-American, Munir Bikin, who teaches at the University of California, Los Angeles, after getting his Ph.D. locally here at the University of Maryland. He's an ethnomusicologist in the fullest sense, not only a splendid performer, but an outstanding scholar and a composer much in demand, particularly in his native Turkey. Okay, Brian, enough talk. Let's listen to more of his music. What are we going to be hearing? A composition in the mode Rast, which, as you will hear, has intervals very slightly different from those of the Western scale. And you can hear more of Munir Bacon's jizz, jizz, Brian's blog, which is www.voaworldmusic.com. If you use the search term Bacon, B-E-K-I-N, you're going to find it. That's Brian Q. Silver, VOA's own ethnomusicologist. Thanks, as always, for joining us. We'll see you next time. My pleasure, Paul. This has been VOA's Middle East Monitor. Join us Monday through Friday for news from the region, inches to the region. Coming up on International Edition, North Korea enters a new era as young Kim Jong-un ascends. Thanks for tuning in to Voice of America.
Are you following the uprisings in Syria, Egypt, and other Arab Spring countries? Want to contribute? Voice of America has launched a new social journalism website for the Arab Spring called Middle East Voices. Incubated by our thousands of fans on Facebook and Twitter and dedicated journalists at VOA, this site takes a new approach to covering the region through investigative journalism, publishing your viewpoints, and harnessing social media to tell stories in a new innovative way. Become a contributor at MiddleEastVoices.com.